welcome to shankar's daily news analysis today's topic of discussion is in this first article we will discuss about the national mission on natural farming so we will discuss what are the key features of this mission and others as well and in the second article we will discuss about the ecologically sensitive areas and the legal framework behind that and in the third article discussion we will detailly discuss about the secular and the social principle which is enshrined in the preamble of the constitution and the recent supreme court order regarding that and in the last article discussion you will see about the mace so without further delay let's get into today's discussion so take a look at this article which is taken from the science page of the hindu this article totally talks about the mace which is the major atmospheric cherenkov experiment and this is located at the hanley dark reserve which is located in ladakh so what we have to understand from the prelims perspective is that whenever there is a topic in science and tech we have to understand first what it is then we have to understand what is the applications of this technology so if we read this name itself we we'll, many of us might not know what is cherenkov let's have a understanding of that first and this experiment is mainly focused on to observe the gamma ray radiation this is the main objective of this experiment so this gamma ray when we consider the electromagnetic spectrum this gamma ray has the lowest and the shortest wavelength but high energy usually in uh, the universe there are many high energy system such as supernova the black hole and we also have the gamma ray burst so they will re release this gamma ray and this high energy will be emitted throughout the universe whenever they will interact with the atmosphere in the earth they will produce some secondary particles so this secondary particles can be electron positron and they will also have high energy so these secondary particle tend to travel at a speed which is greater than the speed of light which is 10 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second so this secondary particle will travel at a speed greater than the speed of light so they will have the capacity to produce a bluish color radiation and that radiation is called as the cherenkov radiation so this radiation can also be seen in case of the nuclear reactors so this nuclear reactors will also produce this bluish radiation called as the cherenkov radiation so this is discovered by a person called as cherenkov and he was offered the nobel prize for physics in the year 1958 so what this maze does is that it will observe this cherenkov radiations and this will be able to understand about the gamma radiation which is emitted by the high energy system which is located in the universe this is the basic understanding which you have to have about the cherenkov radiation this cherenkov radiation is also used in case of the cancer diagnostics so having understand about the term cherenkov radiation now let's get into the understanding of this maze so this is a ground based gamma ray telescope so this is the maze which is located in the hanley dark reserve in ladakh so it is the highest imaging cherenkov telescope in the world and it is located in such high altitude which is about 4.3 km above the sea level so why it is located in such a high altitude so if it is located in such a high altitude it will be free from the light pollution which is basically found in all these cities so the absence of light in such high altitude will help us to observe the gamma ray radiation effectively this is the purpose why it is located in such high altitude and it is the asia's largest and the second largest cherenkov telescope in the world these are the facts you have to remember about this and it has a diameter of about 21 meter so this maze is developed by the baba atomic research center tata institute of fundamental research and the electronic corporation of india limited all of them developed this mace so what is the purpose of this maze maze observes the gamma ray radiation which is re emitted by the high energy system so let's take the supernova 
supernova is created by the death of stars so they also emit the gamma ray radiation which is used to which is absorbed by this mass also we have the black hole so whenever a system gets into be a massive star or a neutron star whenever it is absorbed by the black hole they will produce gamma ray radiation which is also absorbed by this mass second we, we thirdly we have the gamma ray burst during such high energy events the gamma ray is emitted all this gamma rays absorbed by the mass is used to study the high energy event which will create a scope for india to understand about the high energy events which are taking place in the universe effectively as already said these gamma rays have high energy which exceeds almost 20 billion electron volts and it is also used to explore the gamma rays which is emitted by these celestial objects also the third objective of this maze is to study the dark matter through the hypothetical particles such as the weakly interactive massive particles so this is a component of dark matter dark matter is nothing but they do not emit light they do not absorb light and they even do not reflect light so by studying the gamma ray particles from these dark matter we will be able to understand the dark matters which is unknown to many it is also used to explore many extreme cosmic events so having the highly dark reserve in ladakh it is also creating a scope for india to explore the scientific tourism because many of them who are interested in exploring the high energy events to understand the gamma ray particles might go to the hanley dark reserve and they also may be interested to have the look of the maze so this is a creating a scope for the scientific tourism to india so now let's try to understand what are the features of this telescope let's have a quick glimpse of that so it as already said it's op it is operating on the principle of cherenkov radiation we have understood about that in the starting of the discussion and it also consists of many mirrors which are arranged in honeycomb structure so all these mirrors will focus this gamma radiation into a camera which consists of almost 1088 pixel camera and this camera will collect all these gamma radiation and they have the capacity to even observe the faint gamma ray radiation and they will amplify it so this maze also has the electronic device which will collect all this gamma ray radiation and convert them into digital data so by converting them into the digital data we will be able to have a real time monitoring which is game changing also they are located in high altitude which is about 4.3 km above the mean sea level so these are the, some key features you have to understand about the maze so this is a ground based telescope it is located here with this understanding let's see a prelims practice question consider the following statements maze major atmospheric cherenkov experiment telescope is a state of art ground based gamma ray telescope so here the keyword is ground so the answer is one is correct and it is the asia's largest and second largest globally after the h2 yes this statement is also correct the major objective of this telescope is to detect and study the gamma rays yes this part is correct and with the energies exceeding up to 20 million electron volts so you have to understand and learn certain datas but you need not accurately remember that so here they have changed the billion to million which is a huge change so the option would be incorrect these kind of datas will be asked in the prelims question so you need to have a basic understanding of the data you know you need not remember the data accurately so what will be the correct answer for this question the correct answer will be 1 and 2 so with this we'll conclude the discussion on this article and now let's see the next one so this article talks about the announcement made by the central government regarding the national mission on natural farming so whenever there is a scheme announced by the government what are the aspects we have to cover regarding that is whether it is a central sector scheme or a centrally sponsored scheme this is the first thing we have to cover and it is coming under what ministry that is the second thing we have to cover next we have to address what are the features of it 
three important aspects that we need to cover regarding these schemes. So, this scheme that is the National Mission on Natural Farming is a centrally sponsored scheme. So, what is the difference between centrally sponsored scheme and central sector scheme? So, central sector scheme is a scheme which is totally funded by the government that is 100 percentage of the fund is given by the government. On the other hand, centrally sponsored scheme is where a part of fund is given by the central government and another part is given by the state government. But in case of northeastern state, 90 percentage of the fund is given by the central government and 10 percentage is given by the state government. And the schemes which are coming under the state list and concurrent list mostly comes under the centrally sponsored scheme. But whatever the subjects which are coming under the union list come under the central sector scheme. This is the basic difference and this national mission on natural farming is a centrally sponsored scheme. And nextly under which ministry this schemes comes under? This schemes comes under the ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare. So, the second question is also addressed. So, what we have to learn about this is, so nextly we will try to understand what is natural farming. So, this is a eco-friendly and a chemical free agriculture method. So, let us start the agriculture practice which is widely practiced in current time. So, we use the HYV seeds. So, in natural farming we are going to replace this HYV seeds with the indigenous seeds. This is the first thing. And secondly, we use chemical fertilizer. And in this natural farming we are going to replace this chemical fertilizer with the locally available resources such as we are going to use the cow dung, we are going to use the cow urine. These are the things we are going to use by replacing the chemical fertilizer. These are the two aspects which are important with respect to the natural farming. All this is an important factor for the natural farming. So, we are going to use the locally available sources. We are not going to source anything from the external environment. So, it is going to cost a low input for the farmers and there is a self-reliance because we are going to use only the locally available resources. These are some key aspects of this natural farming. Another thing you have to understand is the difference between natural farming and organic farming. Let us see. In natural farming, we are going to use only the locally available resources which are present within the field. We are going to use the indigenous seeds, we are going to use the cow dung, cow urine, these are the things we are going to use. But in case of organic farming, external outputs are, external inputs are allowed, but they have to be organic in nature. This is the aspect of organic farming. Nextly, to manage the soil health, we are going to use practices such as zero tillage where tilling is not done to the crop field and we are going to use techniques like mulching where the organic matter is spread throughout the field that is the dead plants from the previous crop season is left and this will help us to retain the soil moisture it will also prevent the soil erosion and natural amendments are done to the soil but in case of organic farming we are going, we are going to use products such as organic manure, vermicompost and crop rotation. This is going to cost low because we are going to use only the locally available inputs which are in the access of farmers. But in case of organic farming, it is going to cost high because all these products are usually in because all these products are expensive and it is going to cost a high amount for the farmers. So, the practices with respect to natural farming are zero budget natural farming, no tillage farming and no weeding. And with respect to organic farming, we have the crop diversification, green manure and composting. I would also like to add the four pillars of zero budget natural farming. So, we have four aspects. One is the panchamrit. So, what is this panchamrit? This consists of five things, the cow dung, cow urine the gram floor, jaggery and water. This mixture is used to enrich the microbial quality of the soil. Also, it will improve the soil nutrients. And second, we have the jiva amrit. Jiva amrit is nothing but we are going to treat the indigenous seeds with 
cow dung and cow urine. This will increase the efficiency of the seed to fight against any bacterial or fungal infection and this is highly beneficial to the farmers. And thirdly, we have the process called as mulching where organic matter is spread throughout the soil to retain the soil moisture. And lastly, we have the aeration technique where 50 percentage air and 50 percentage of water will be there. It will reduce the requirement of water to the field. So, these are the four pillars of the zero budget natural farming. So, now we will see what are the advantages of this natural farming. So, this is going to minimize the health risk because, because we are going to replace the chemical fertilizer with the organic fertilizer such as uh, cow dung and cow urine and it is going to minimize the health risk and hazards. It is also going to increase the income of the farmers because we are going to access only the products which are within the locally available farm. So, it will not cost much amount to the farmers. And thirdly, it is also going to improve the soil health. It is going to increase the microbial quality in the soil. So, these are the important benefits of the natural farming. So, this natural farming has a lot of benefits. But why farmers are having a hesitation in practicing it? Because it consists of certain challenges as well. First is the lack of irrigation facilities and there is a limited availability of the natural inputs because to source this high amount of natural inputs, it is highly challenging because the farmers might have only few animal resources with them that is the cow dung and cow urine with that minimal amount, they will not be able to meet the requirements of the field. That is why this national mission on natural farming is planning to integrate the animal husbandry with the agriculture and this will be able to cut out this particular challenge. It is also lacking a crop diversification because of the skewed MSP which is offered particularly to the cereals. Many of these farmers are mainly focused on cultivating the cereals. So, this is also yeah, another challenge. So, what are the initiatives that are taken by the government to face this challenge? First is the Paramgrath Krishi Vikas Yojana. Under this scheme, they are planning to improve the sustainable and natural farming. And the sub-scheme of this scheme is a scheme called as Bharatiya Pragrit Krishi Padati. Under this scheme, they are offering financial assistance to promote the sustainable and natural farming. So, under this scheme, almost 8 states are given with financial support, particular, particularly in the Ganga corridor. And thirdly, we have the National Mission on Natural Farming, which we are discussing right now. And fourthly, we have the Climate Smart Agriculture, which mainly focuses on a sustainable agriculture productivity, that is to increase the farmer's income. And secondly, they also plan to reduce the greenhouse gas emission and thirdly the other focus area of this climate smart agriculture is the climate ready the climate resilience so they are focusing on adaptation as well as mitigation to the climate change in the current era so these are the initiatives taken by the government to combat the challenges which are offered by the natural farming so now let's see a prelims practice question with reference to natural farming in India, consider the following statement. One, natural farming eliminates the use of synthetic fertilizer and pesticides. Yes, this statement is correct. And second, this national mission on natural farming is an upscaled version of the Bharatiya Pragrit Krishi Padati. Yes, this statement is also correct. And thirdly, we have the statement called as under the Bharatiya Pragrit Krishi Padati, a special focus is given to promote the natural farming along the Ganga corridor. This statement is also correct. So, the correct answer would be 1, 2 and 3. Another important thing I would like to add upon is the state Andhra Pradesh and Himachal Pradesh are pioneer are the best examples in case of the natural farming because almost 7 lakh farmers are covered under this scheme of the Andhra Pradesh state. So, what is the beneficiary of this natural farming? So, almost 1 crore 
farmers are targeted under this national mission on natural farming. So, these are the facts we have to remember regarding the national mission on na natural farming. With this, let us conclude the discussion on this article and now let us move on to the next. So, today is 26th of November. About 75 years ago on the same date, which is 26th of November, the constitution of India was adopted. And this day marks the 75th years of the constitution day. So, from the year 2015, as notified by the Ministry of Social Justice and Welfare, we are celebrating the constitutional day on 26th of November every year. And the tagline for today's and the tagline for this year is our constitution, our pride. This is the tagline for this year. No doubt the constitution reflects all the constitutional values but particularly the preamble reflects all the fundamental core values of the constitution and the whole country. And the recent order given by the Supreme Court says that the terms secular and socialist are an inalienable part of the constitution and they represent the core value of the constitution. Let us see what it is. As already said, we are celebrating the 75th years of the constitution. This is the day constitution was adopted by the constitutional assembly. Do not confuse it with the Jan 26 where the constitution came into the effect on Jan 26 and we became the republic on Jan 26. So, but 26th of November is the day when constitution was adopted. So, with respect to this constitution day, we have launched a year long campaign called as the Hamara Samvidan Hamara Samman. It is a year long initiative which is focused on digital level where a digital initiative is taken by the government to improve the understanding of the citizens regarding the constitution and to have a practical applicability of the constitution. This is the aim of this initiative. And the tagline of this year is Hamara Samvidan Hamara Swabiban, which is our constitution, our pride. So, the main aim of this year is to honor all the constitutional makers and to re ensure all the democratic and the inclusive values of the constitution. So, based on this year, they have also launched a special website called as the constitution75.com. So, under this constitution, you can access all the text, the full text of the constitution in your particular language. So, the constitution text is available in multiple language in this website. You can also read the constitution in your preferred language and record a video and can post it in this website. You will be awarded with a participation certificate for this purpose. Also, you can access all the constitutional assembly debates in this website. Similar to chat GPT, this website also has a special AI features called as the know your constitution. Under this feature, you can ask whatever question you, you can ask whatever question you have regarding the constitution and it will have a detailed answer regarding the question. So, these are the special features of this website called as the constitution75.com which is launched specifically for the celebration of the 75th year of constitution day. So, so this is the recent judgment or the supreme court order which is given by the supreme court. It has upheld the socialism and secularism as the core value of the constitution. Socialism was included in the basic structure in the case of another Bharati case. So, it is considered as a core value under this supreme court order. So, this order has also reaffirmed that these two provisions are important to have a dynamic and an inclusive framework in India. It also ensured there is a relevance of these two features in the evolving democracy as well. So, let us have a detailed discussion of these two terms. So, let us start with the socialism first. So, in case of India, we have the democratic socialism. So, it consists of three aspects. One is the political democracy and second we have the social justice and thirdly we have the economic justice. Under political democracy, it says that every citizen of India has the right to vote and ra right to be elected. 
So, under the Article 326, which is the universal adult suffrage, everyone, any citizen in India who are in the age of above 18 has a right to vote irrespective of their race, religion, caste, sex. So, they have the right to vote. This is the first aspect under the political democracy. They also have the right to be get elected in case of lo local bodies, in case of legislative assemblies, in case of Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha. Every individual has to qualify certain conditions to get elected. And thirdly, we have the rule of law which says that law is the supreme authority and every individual is equal before law. So, these three ensures there is a political democracy in India. And secondly, we have the social justice. To ensure the social justice in India, we have certain specific article. Firstly, we have article 15, which says there is a prohibition of discrimination on grounds of race, religion, caste, sex and place of birth. So, this ensures there is no discrimination among the individual and it will ensure the social justice. And secondly, we have the article 17, which abolishes the untouchability, which is practiced in any kind. So, this will also ensure the social justice in the society. And it also prohibits the forced labor. And we also have special provisions which are provided to the SC and ST. And this will create a social justice for the marginalized section of the society. By all these specific provisions, we can ensure the social justice in India. And in case of economic justice, we have Article 41, which ensures we have the right to work and education. And secondly, we have the Article 39, Clause B. So, which ensures that it is the duty of the state to ensure there is an equitable distribution of wealth among the citizens. And under Article 39, Clause C, it ensures that there is an equal pay for e equal work. So, all these three articles comes under the DPSP. It is non-justiciable in nature, but it is the duty of the state to provide these provisions. So, this is what we have to understand regarding the socialism. Coming to the secularism, in India, we practice a secularism where we are equidistant from all the religion, but we also have a tolerance towards all the religion. Here the word tolerance is very important because we intervene in certain conditions to ensure there is a social welfare among the citizens. So, no, we do not have any official religion and we pay respect to all the religion, but if there is any discrimination within the religion, the state has the power to intervene and to ensure there is a social justice. So, what are the articles and provisions which are ensuring the secularism in India? So, with respect to fundamental rights, we have the article 15 which prohibits the discrimination and under article 25 to 28, we have the fundamental rights with respect to the religion. And Article 25 ensures there is a freedom of religion among the citizen and this no tax can be collected for promoting the religion under 27. And there is also provisions under 28 and 29 and there is also provisions under 29 and 30 which ensures the rights of the minorities. So, the minorities also have certain rights to protect and preserve their language, script and culture. So, there is a restriction of religious instruction in case of state institutions. This is the another provisions which ensure the secularism in India. Under DPSC, we have the article 44 which promotes the uniform civil code among the India. Under the article 51A plus E, we have the provision to promote the harmony beyond the unreligious divide. So, these are the provisions which are promoting the secularism in India. The key term we have to remember regarding the secularism is tolerance. We have tolerance towards all religion, but we intervene to ensure there is a social justice. So, with this knowledge, let us see a prelims practice question. 
विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग आर्टिकल एक्सप्लिसिटली रिफ्लेक्ट दी सोशलिस्टिक प्रिंसिपल सो आर्टिकल फोर्टीन विच इंश्योर दर इज अक्वालिटी बिफोर लॉ एंड ईक्वल प्रोटेक्शन ऑफ लॉ एंड वी नो दट सोशलिज्म द मेन कॉन्सेप्ट इज टू रिड्यूस द inequality so this promotion of equality will definitely reduce the inequality so option 1 will be incorrect and in option 2 it is also correct which ensures there is a equitable distribution of wealth and thirdly we have article 41 which is the right to work and education this is also correct and article 46 gives special provisions to promote the interest of certain classes such as sc and st all these are reflecting the socialistic principle in india so the correct answer would be b 1 2 3 and 4 with this let's complete the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one so take a look at this article which is taken from indian express newspaper this article talks about the kerala state government wants almost 8590 square kilometer area as the eco sensitive area in the western ghats so what we have to focus from the prelims perspective is that we have to learn what are these ecologically sensitive areas what is the criteria used by the government to decide a ecologically sensitive area and what is the legal framework behind that so let's start the discussion so it is simple ecologically sensitive areas are nothing but the areas which are ecologically fragile in nature and it requires a protection these are called as the ecologically sensitive areas it is simple so we are declaring certain areas ecologically sensitive area so that it will be protected efficiently and it will reduce the impact of humans in that particular area and will enhance the conservation in this area so it is usually present around protected areas such as wildlife sanctuary natural park around these protected areas we have certain buffer zones and usually these buffer zones will coincide with the ecologically sensitive areas so what is the criteria for declaring any particular area as ecologically sensitive area so first is the endemism and the biologically biodiversity richness so any area which is having a high biodiversity richness and it is having a specific endemic species there all these regions are usually declared as the ecologically sensitive area and secondly if any area is ecologically fragile such as areas which are prone to landslide regions which are prone to natural disasters these are also considered under the ecologically sensitive areas because sustainable development practices can be conducted in these ecologically fragile areas and they can reduce the impact of human activities and damaging activities in these areas and thirdly we have the hydrologically importance areas which are having a high hydrological importance such as the wetlands the rivers and many large water resources are also considered for declaring an area as a ecologically sensitive area and fourthly we have the forest cover so regions which are having high forest covers are also considered for example in this case we have the aravalli hills so the re- region having high forest covers such as the western ghats and eastern ghats are also considered as the ecologically sensitive area and thirdly and next we have the cultural and sacred significance regions having this criteria is also considered for the ecological sensitive area as already said if any region surrounding the protected area such as the wildlife sanctuary national park and biodiversity reserves all these areas which are surrounding the protected areas are considered for declaring them as a ecologically sensitive areas to improve the efficiency of protection under these protected areas so these are the criteria which are considered for declaring any area as ecologically sensitive area so let's see a map in relation with this so we have the western ghats here 
which is covering almost the Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu. The parts of these regions are considered as ecologically sensitive areas and certain parts of the Eastern Ghats are also considered on the ecologically sensitive areas. Nextly, with respect to hydrological importance, many lakes, let us uh, take the Chilika Lake, the Loktak Lake, all these lakes are also coming under the ecologically sensitive areas. And next we have the Andaman and Nicobar Island here. This is also considered as an ecologically sensitive area because of its richness in coral reefs and the mangroves. The part of Ganga and Brahmaputra Delta along with the Sundar Bands is also a ecologically sensitive area. We also have the Aravalli Ranges, parts of the Thar Deserts of Rajasthan because they are ecologically fragile because of the drought prone regions. The Himalayan region that is covering Ladakh, Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal, Uttarakhand, and parts of north and northeastern states also comes under the ecologically sensitive areas. So, we saw the criteria and the examples for the ecologically sensitive areas. Now, let us see the legal framework behind this. Firstly, we have the Environmental Protection Act which restricts the development activities in these areas. And secondly, we have the Wildlife Protection Act which provides the basis for creating a buffer zone. Buffer zone is nothing but the region surrounding the protected areas and the buffer zone is going to coincide with the ecologically sensitive areas in many places. And thirdly, we have the Forest Conservation Act of 1980 which limits the deforestation and damaging activities in this ecologically sensitive areas. We also have committees such as Gargil Committee which was constituted in the year 2011 and the Kasturi Rangan Committee which demarcated the boundaries for the ecologically sensitive areas in the western Ghats. And many Supreme Court ruling has also supported the notification of ecologically sensitive areas to declare the regions around the protected areas as the ecologically sensitive areas and to minimize the damaging activities there. For example, mining which can harm the environment there, deforestation and the construction activities. So, these are the legal frameworks which are supporting the ecologically sensitive areas. So, what are the activities which are permitted there and what are the activities which are not allowed in the ecologically sensitive areas? Any mining or industrial activities and large scale constructions are not allowed in case of ecologically sensitive areas and the tourism, agriculture and renewable energy projects are regulated in case of this ecologically sensitive areas. Added to that, the agroforestry, organic farming and the ecotourism is promoted in this region. So, what is the significance of declaring any area as the ecologically sensitive area? It helps in the conservation of biodiversity because it will protect the endemic species in that region because we are going to prohibit the mining activities, any environmentally damaging activities there. It will help in the protection of that endemic species in the ecologically sensitive areas. It also helps to prevent the disasters because according to the article, the regions in the Vayanadu is suggested for declaring that area as a ecologically sensitive area. By regulating the activities in this region, we can mitigate the impact of disasters such as floods and landslide in these areas. And it also helps in the sustainable development because it is going to balance the economy by promoting the sustainable development and also by protecting the environmental condition in there. So, it will balance the ecology and the economy at the same time. And lastly, it also helps to preserve the carbon sink because it prohibits the deforestation in this particular region. So, in this article discussion, we saw what is ecologically sensitive areas, areas which are fragile and they require the protection. We saw the criteria and the example in India. We also saw what is the significance and what are the activities which are promoted, prohibited and regulated in those particular region. So, now let us see a prelims practice question. In which category are local people not allowed to collect the biomass? 
So this question is a previous year question which was asked in the year 2012. So the answer is national park. So in national parks, the local people are not allowed to collect the biomass. We have also posted a editorial analysis monthly marathon for the October month. You can check the YouTube Shankarai's Academy videos for accessing this video and to have a clear picture about all the editorials in the October month. We have come to end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedbacks as comment and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.